Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. All right, welcome to the American Potential podcast. What a great episode we have talking about empowerment and how we can use uh, the, the power of your activism to release the the barriers that are out there on so, so many levels. And one of them is on children's education and K-12 through education. We're going to talk about that a little bit today and how Americans for Prosperity worked with policymakers, policy champions, and others and activists in the state of Arizona to empower kids and parents to take control of their child's education. I'm joined by actually someone who's a great friend, uh, Stephen Shattig, who is the state director of Americans for Prosperity in Arizona. Stephen, thanks for joining us and for being with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. I've always been a big fan of your show, so I'm looking forward to this one. Awesome. Well, great. I, I appreciate you uh, appreciate you being on. So first of all, I want to let's talk about Arizona, you, why you decided that this was a battle to, to fight in the political um, the, the political situation there in Arizona that made it possible to do. But let's talk a little bit about you first. I mean, you're a lifelong Arizonan, right? Yep, third generation native. Third generation. Your grandfather worked, ran Barry Goldwater, some campaigns yes. for Barry Goldwater. Yeah. Right? He ran uh, Barry Goldwater's first campaign in 1950. Yeah. Uh, and that was kind of the unheard campaign. And, and that time in Arizona, Democrats outnumbered Republicans, I think it was 10 to 1. Um, and so that kind of kicked off uh, the lineage of the Stratic family and getting involved in politics. Yes. And then it it stayed. That lineage was carried on down. Your dad was a U.S. congressman for, for several terms, right? Yep. So he served in office from 1994 to 2010. Uh, when he first ran, I was a kindergartner. Yeah. Uh, and when he retired, I was a I think, junior in college. So – uh, I spent my entire childhood uh, growing up kind of in the spotlight of American politics and conservatism. Yeah. Well, you look just like your dad. I've told you that before. <laughs> and uh, your dad was a member of Congress. I worked actually – I worked on Capitol Hill when your dad was a congressman and, and always, uh, you know, just kind of one of the true leaders in, in, in thought in, in, pol- in politics and in Congress at that time. Um, but from what I understand, you and I were talking before <laughs> earlier today – he doesn't know how to work a VCR now. Is that he's a little technology challenged? Is that right? There's some technological challenges there. <laughs> um, it, it, it probably comes from the fact that when he was back in office, he'd always carry around two or three different Blackberries. Yeah, right. Um, once they got rid of the Blackberry, the iPhone and my dad just don't agree uh, when it comes to sending <laughs> emails. When it comes to casting things, there's a uh, there's definitely a gap there um, that we try to help him as much as we can. And then a lot of it's also uh, we call it kind of the the pampered mentality is that, you know, sometimes I think uh, the the assistance on for members yeah. uh, can maybe go a little bit too far uh, and there needs to be more independence driven. Yeah. Uh, so maybe somewhere down the road they can do a cultural change. Well, in Congress. except I'm guessing there's lots of people who are listening to this right now and thinking, no, I don't think it has anything to do because my dad or mom wasn't a congressman and they can't figure it out either. Probably very, very true. <laughs> OK. And you even helped him. You said last night, uh, did your wife have to go over and, and yes. help? Yes. So uh, they had some issues. They wanted to stream the hit series, uh, which was followed after Yellowstone. I think it's 1923. Uh-huh. Um, and they were struggling to get Paramount uh, pictures on. And so my wife went over from our house and right. uh, she got a dinner out of it. So that was good. Well, but she good. set it up. And, and then uh, what, what ended up taking place is as she was getting ready to leave, my dad said, hey, I actually need your help on this email. Uh, and she said, you know what? I got to get back to work. I've got some stuff in the oven. Yeah. So I got to take off. So she said, you should schedule that, though, with your technical assistant. So you <laughs> – <laughs> and is that you? No, that's, oh, her. that's her. That's definitely okay, her. Okay, so your wife is the IT person. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Unlike you, you're you're the IT person in your family, right? Well, for my mother in law, yeah, she'll call, she calls me Jefferson. I don't know why. She <laughs> go Jefferson. I have a red dot on my iPhone. What can I do? Oh, give me the phone. So <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, it's it's great to talk. Okay, so I want to talk to you about uh, empower. Well, you call them not educational savings accounts in. Arizona, you call them empowered scholarship accounts. But this is really changing the dynamic, changing the paradigm of education in America because it's taking the power of, of 
the decision about what school you go to. It's always being controlled by what zip code you lived in, right? Correct. Yep. And it's empowering a parent and a child to get the education that that child needs. More importantly, it puts the child ahead of the system. Correct. And uh, so tell us about how this came about in Arizona. Sure. Um, so – I'll start with kind of – we do call them empowerment scholarships. Um, they're called all types of different things across the country. Um, I think you, know, you can view them as you know, educational freedom. But um, the kind of the story of how this all came about uh, in Arizona, um, I think it's important for listeners to understand that this just didn't take place overnight. Um, and while COVID uh, definitely caused some struggles for you know, many Americans – um, there were some good things that actually came out of COVID, um, one of which was this opportunity, um, which really was spurred by uh, a excess of funds. Um, and in Arizona, that allowed us to, quite frankly, pass historic tax reforms that ended up rolling into an opportunity for educational savings accounts. Um, in a nutshell, I'd say that we talk about, you know, how do we transform education for students? Um, and transformation doesn't happen overnight, right? It's a series of very strategic events that are planned. Um, and I think that what we saw in Arizona that, that you know, allowed us to take this big step was uh, a culmination of a decade's worth of work um, and the kind of the, the opportunity to seize that narrative and to seize that window that we had where there's all this funding um, to really change the lives of many students in Arizona. So I, as, as you went through this, I'm sure you met some 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 great examples of how this can like revolutionize someone's life, totally change and alter the course of their life. Um, I mean, do you have any stories of activists who got involved or, or others? And I know that in your case, it was really electing policy champions who who were able to to advance the ball on these uh, uh, educational savings accounts or empowered scholarship accounts. But I'm sure you have examples of kids whose lives were changed or who were stuck in a failing school system and now they're able to go and and take the, their money, right, the money yep. that, that they're entitled to uh, under the laws of Arizona and ed- get the education that they want to have. Yes. Um, we, we have lots of stories. I think some of the, the best stories that I've seen is that um, for, for many students, um, I don't think they recognize that maybe the current school uh, or system that they're in is working for them, but it's their parents that first recognize that. Uh, and you know, I could tell you stories of, of certain parents that we've met um, where it, it really is impactful to see the student for the first time. Like the, the, the parents are, are very uh, enthusiastic about you know their child was struggling with some type of learning disability or maybe they just weren't the type of student who took test um, the traditional format way, right? Writing down the score. And so there was options where once they moved into a new uh, opportunity, like a charter school, um, they could learn visually or they could learn auditorily. Um, and seeing that student for the first time um, begin to realize that their potential and to realize that for the ones that were struggling uh, and many that aren't struggling, right? Ones, ones that are very smart need better opportunities. But uh, for those that are struggling and, and kind of put that pressure on themselves that they're not actually smart, which is false. And and to see them and see their parents connect those two and seeing the kind of the impact they can have on both their life and the parent's life, um, it it is very inspiring. Um, And so it's it's those types of stories that we saw begin to take place. And quite frankly, the the COVID pandemic really brought that apart, brought that along because you had these students sitting at home and you had parents struggling to try to get their student to interact on this virtual camera when they just need to be moving in with other parents. And so uh, it allowed us to highlight that opportunity of, look, students aren't all the same. They're individuals, right? Each one of us is unique and our learning opportunities should be just as unique. Well, and I think there's so many examples of, as you said, COVID was so bad and so terrible, particularly on young people, right, and students. But there is this silver lining, which is this this movement. I mean, it really got parents engaged. First of all, parents got to see what was being taught to their kids, and that energized parents to take action, go to school board meetings, um, and, and to really, you know, take control of their kids' education. But the other thing that it really taught them is, look, I, I've got to – doing my kids' homework, I'm learning what they're learning or not learning what they're learning, whatever the case may be. 
but it really got parents more engaged. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about uh, these empowered scholarship accounts in Arizona, right, is that you've got parents now engaged in their kids' education because now they've got some skin in the game. Yep. And they're in control rather than the school system, rather than a teacher's union right. or – you know, a, a bureaucrat in Washington, D.C. at the Department of Education. So now the parents have the power. Yeah. So this is a real paradigm shift in education. Oh, it absolutely is. I think that it, it, it does a wonderful job of highlighting that every student has the p- full potential to exceed and excel at whatever they want to do. It's their parents recognizing that it's not that they can't learn it. It's that they learn differently or that maybe there's a better place for them to learn. Um, and I think it's, it's going to shift the paradigm when it comes to the future of our country. Um, students are going to be brighter. It's going to cause innovation. It's going to cause um, you know, an acceleration of what we can do as a society as a whole. Let's talk too about what this does. You know, I, I'm just going to be honest here. I think uh, particularly minority children – have been under in some of these underserved school districts are the ones that have suffered the most, right? Because they are trapped in a school. If you're affluent and um, you you live in a in a in a nice neighborhood, your taxes are probably a little higher. Your schools might be even better. But if you have the resources, you can send your kids to a private school if right. you if you choose to do that. But so many kids, I mean, the school system in many ways are failing kids. Like, you know, we look at scores, test scores. Sometimes it'll be 10 percent, 15, 20, 30 percent proficiency in math and reading. That means that 70 percent of the kids are failing. And, yeah. and like we're, we're happy somehow as a society that the test scores are 30 percent instead of 27. I mean, that means 70 percent right. of the kids in that school district are failing. Right. This – again, takes the power and gives it to the parents that if they don't like that school, they don't like that school district that they, in many cases, are trapped in, they can go somewhere else. Right. And when if you look at the system and, and you know, in those cases where, the, you know, 70 percent of children are failing, there comes a point where you have to say, you know, uh, there there is opposition to this effort, right? And, and many of the opponents to this say that, oh, well, it's because we don't have enough funding. Uh, there's not enough funding per child, right? Um, and I, I think that there's this movement allowed us to really challenge that and say, but does the funding help the child succeed or does the education and how that child needs to be educated really change? And, right. and I think that's the answer. So, I mean, I'll ask this question. You may not know the answer, but what's the per pupil funding amount yeah. in Arizona? So right now, on average, it's about $7,000 per right. pupil that uh, – is enrolled in ESAs or in educational uh, scholarship accounts in Arizona. Uh, and there, as of I think this month, there's about 45,000 students enrolled in that program. Uh, and the increase in students that have been applying, there's now a 45-day waiting period uh, for that application to be processed. So the concept here is why would we, – we live in a society right now without these um, empowerment scholarship accounts – we live in a society that that says, you know, you will go to this school. You will go to this district because this is what we tell you to do. What this is saying is, hey, we're going to take this $7,000, let's say, and if, if a student wants to go somewhere else to get educated and their parents make that decision, then that's what they're going to do. Correct. It, I mean, it's such a simple concept, but and, and it – you know, such a free market reform if you think if you think about it. But it's it's so hard to get to that. And I want to talk about how you got there uh, in Arizona. You had a different strategy. A lot of times these are these are hard fought grassroots fights, right? Yep. Where where parents are coming in, we see what's happened at school boards and others where where parents show up at these school boards. In Arizona it was a little bit different. You worked to elect policy champions, right, yep. who cared about this issue, to push this issue. You had a governor in Governor Ducey who was very aligned on the issue. Correct. And you pushed that through. So tell us about that. Sure. So uh, starting in the beginning, I think uh, you know one of our amazing capabilities that we have uh, with Americans for Prosperity is the ability to, headed into election, identify a 
individual who's running for office who we feel is going to be a policy champion. They they meet our standard of is what is required here uh, in our organization. Um, and so we identified two specific ones that, that really turned into being our big champions. Um, one would be Representative Ben Toma, who is now uh, the Speaker of the House. Uh, and then the other is Jen, uh, J.D. Mesnard in the Senate. Um, and headed into the, I think it was 2019 session, um, all of that COVID money was sitting there and there was this amazing opportunity to reduce our income tax. We had a four bracket system. Um, there had been some other legislation that had been, or a ballot initiative that passed that wanted to call for an extra 3.5% to increase for funding for education. Long and short of it is we were able to pass a flat tax of 2.5%. Um, as everybody always does in the, the opposition, it's never easy. Uh, there was a challenge to that. Um, it turns out that that challenge uh, once again created this amazing momentum and timing, right? Um, so you now have the next in, in 2021, um, there was a lot of funding still left there. Um, there was a question around if we wanted to accelerate our income tax because it was being challenged. Um, and so we were able to leverage this funding, which is roughly about a billion dollars, uh, actually it might be $1.3 billion, um, to ensure that the income tax stayed. And then once that part of the negotiation was done, um, things totally changed, changed in our strategy. Our, our strategy on the income tax was a grassroots effort. Um, our strategy on the Empowerment Scholarships Program was an under the dome effort. Um, and it was purely led by Representative Ben Toma. Um, and to, to, it's hard to describe the negotiation process, um, but, you know, Representative Toma deserves so much credit because he sat with two members behind closed doors um, and we were communicating with him. And throughout that process, people would ask us, you know, what's going on with it? You know, and by this time, we had worked with him over a full term. We understood. He understood what we were looking for. Um, I remember certain conversations in which I said, look, whatever you need, uh, let me know. We trust you. We know what you are pushing forward and it's completely aligned. Um, and through pure patience uh, and not getting frustrated because the members that he was working with could be very frustrating. Um, he was able to negotiate a deal um, that was able to get this done. And I think that the importance of that process of under the dome, it's unique um, to every situation, right? Sometimes grassroots works, sometimes under the dome works. In this case, because the issue has so much energy around it, both positive and negative, uh, I think the under the dome strategy was the best play um, because the education unions were a little bit caught off guard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now that this has passed, let's talk about the impact. So you had a child trying to get educated, stuck in a school. They had to go to that school because they're that, that's the zip code they lived in. And they had their, their parents didn't have the resources to send them to a private school. Now that this has passed. What's changed in that child's life? What can that child now do? Sure. So now every student in the state of Arizona, regardless of their family income, so what took place before, like you pay – taxpayers pay ed for education taxes. Sure. Now that totaled about seventy or $6,600 to $7,000. Um, now, rather than that seventy-seven dollars or $7,000 going directly to the public school that that child was supposed to go to in their zip code, now the parents can simply apply – through uh, the state education committee, they can get an application, fill it out. Their student now receives that $7,000 and that $7,000 will follow them to the school of their choice. So they can enroll in a private school. And there's recent studies that show that the median uh, average tuition rate of a of tuition in private schools in Arizona is $6,600. So now they can fund a majority of a private school education or maybe a charter school education, which is a public school education, with that $7,000. So all you're doing is taking the funds that taxpayers and their parents are already paying right. and being able to use that and allow it to follow the child and basically choose where you want to spend your money. You're no longer – forced to buy the generic TV that everybody tells you had to buy, right? You can right. say, well, I want a bigger TV or I want a smaller TV uh, because it's a better fit for my room. So yeah. that's what they're able to do. That, and that's revolutionary. I mean, it's it's revolutionary to the state of Arizona and it should be revolutionary, really, uh, transformational, if you will, to, to the system, the, the education system, K-12 through education system in Arizona. It's always struck me that you know, and higher education has its problems. I, we're, that's not what we're talking about here. But higher education in America is 
kind of like that, right? Where you can you can go to a private college, you can go to a public university, you can go to a religious or a non-religious. And by the way, you can use Pell Grants, government Pell Grants or student loans at any of those. And so this is really, I mean, it's 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 a it's a radical concept in some people's minds, but it's 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 free market. I mean, it's yeah. like a parent and a child making the decision that's best for them rather than the system making the decision for them. Um, so how does this change as you're looking down the road and what this may mean in five years for the children of Arizona or 10 years for the children of Arizona? What, is this, what does this do? What does it mean? Well, uh, I think the, the first thing it does is actually it, it instinctively you think, okay, we've, we've done it, right? That the fight is over. Uh, and the truth is that the fight just began uh, because there is so much uh, importance on ensuring that not only do we make sure that as many parents and as many students understand that ESAs exist in Arizona, that they have the opportunity to enroll their student in that opportunity and that they're fully utilizing it and that we're telling that story, right? So that we can begin to drive transformation in other states and quite frankly, completely overhaal our education system. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you about that because that's that's your next step, right? It is, is. Is you've got to get out there. I mean, this is great, but if nobody knows about it or uses it, um, it actually somebody will use it against you and say, well, look, you know, they did it in Arizona and it didn't really have an impact. So now you've got to go out and get people to understand that they have this option and that they should exercise it, even if their decision is to stay in the school that works for them and it's the school their kid has been in. So uh, what are you, what's your plans on that in trying to educate the citizens of Arizona? Yeah, so it, I kind of view it as a uh, – if you're a productor, production of a film, uh, you know that you've got a great film. The filming's done. It's been cut. Um, and everybody who is within the industry understands this is wonderful. Uh, now you've got to advertise it, and now you've got to get people to the box office. Um, and you've got to get them to, to walk away saying, wow, that movie really just changed my life. Uh, and so that's what we have to do. We now have to make sure that the citizens of Arizona – know that they have this option. Um, and so the ways we're going to do that is through our uh, greatest capability, grassroots. Um, we're getting to go door to door, talking to parents and educating them as, did you know that we have ESAs, education uh, scholarship accounts? Do you know how to enroll in them? Uh, and for many of these parents, most of them say they don't, they weren't aware of it. They also don't know what it is, um, which gives us another opportunity to have a more formal setting where we can educate them on what an education savings account is. Um, it's also, I think, going to become very powerful in that we're going to begin to transform a student's life through their parents and, and communication of them saying, well, you know, he's really been struggling in school. He's always getting into trouble. And, and it allows us to now begin to drive individuals towards more options, right? And, and empowering parents to see that their child is bright. Uh, it's just that they need a different way to learn the information. Um, so that's what we're starting to do this next year is, is get out there, knock on those doors, um, do the traditional means of, you know, educating people via media. Um, but it really is that one-on-one -on -one interaction that this comes down to because you know, the, the education and empowering students, that empowerment comes in those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And that's where I think we really begin to break barriers and, and move, make a movement of millions uh, is those personal interactions. Yeah, and I would, I would really challenge you as a listener to this podcast to think this through and think through the fact that this might not be – you may be listening to this and saying, well, this isn't for me. My kid's school's great. I would just challenge you that this isn't just about you. This is about our society and what kind of society we're going to have. And just because you might like a certain type of toothpaste doesn't mean everybody wants the same type of toothpaste. And so this is about empowering parents to make those decisions. And if their decision is to keep their child in the same school that they've been in, that's great. That's their decision. But that's the, the, the greatest thing about our country and about – uh, the, the system that we have is that we do have choices to make. We are, they aren't forced upon us by government. Uh, and, and that's what we're about at Americans for Prosperity too is breaking those barriers, allowing people to make those choices rather than government making the choice for them. Right, yep, Stephen? Absolutely. I mean someone asked me the other day, why, why do you – why are you involved in politics? Um, and this is you – know, I'd say freedom. But this is really the best example of it, right? So that – 
you can live your life how you choose. No one can tell you what you can and can't do. And that to me is freedom, right? If you, you know, if you want to buy a soda, if you want to send your child to a better school, you now have that opportunity to do that. And you drive your own success. It's an individual ability to go as high or as far as you want to go. And the only limitation is yourself. It's not uh, the government telling you that you can't do it or that we're not going to help you get there. Such great work in the state of Arizona. You should always be proud of. I mean, just what what a thing to be a part of. And uh, and, and I'm sure you have a lot of activists and others who feel that same way too about this. Just you know, it's really changing lives. And uh, so, congratulations to you and to your team in Arizona and all the great work that you've done there. You've made a real difference. Thank you. I appreciate it. And, and you're right. There's a lot of people that worked really hard to make this happen. And uh, I think it's important to understand that you know, these things don't happen overnight. And we really do have to engage in our government process. We have to engage uh, in our citizen duty to to get out, get engaged in our community, learn about what's going on, because um, it's you can't cause change overnight by yourself. It takes a movement. So. Yeah. Well, listen, go back. Thank your dad for his service in, in Congress. <laughs> Fix his phone for him so it works too, we'll right? Yeah, make sure that you're – you, you, I'll make sure that they watch the next, next episode of uh, 1923. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. All right, empowered scholarship accounts in Arizona are empowering parents and children to take control of their education and their future and their lives. And you can do that too. If you're listening to this and you say, hey, I want to, I want to get involved. I want to get involved with Americans for Prosperity. I want to make uh, education savings accounts possible in my state. Send me an email. You can email me at jeff at AmericanPotential.com. And I'll make sure that we get you involved here. You can also visit us online at AmericanPotential.com. And I just want to thank you for listening. And Stephen, thank you for, for all that you've done. And we will be back with another edition of American Potential. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.